Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We are now in the series, Who We Are in Christ. And for the last few weeks, we've been talking about being the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God. And yesterday, we finished that as we talked about the effects of righteousness. And one of the things we saw is that when we are born again, we're washed in the blood of Jesus. We are also born into God's family. We are born in God's family and we become the children of God. We are God's children and he is our father. As it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason I kneel before the father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So we are are named in his family. His whole family in heaven and on earth receives its name from him. When we are born again, we're born into the kingdom of God. We become children of God, sons of God, heirs of God, and heirs of the kingdom of God. And we did a teaching series some time ago called The Kingdom of God, a very important study for every Christian because most Christians do not understand the kingdom of God. And so if you missed that series, I strongly encourage you to go to my YouTube channel, which is under my name, Cherry Campbell, C-H-E-R-R-I Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. And there you will see that series called The Kingdom of God under the radio broadcast category and you need to click on the category title in order to see all the teaching series in a category and so I encourage you go to my YouTube channel and listen to that series called the kingdom of God and so now in this study of who we are in Christ I want to take another look at at the sonship that we receive, this position, who we are in Christ, we are the sons of God. We are the sons of God. So let us look at a few scriptures, first of all, that tell us that. In John 1, verse 12, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power To become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Let me say that again. Read it again. As many as received him. So if you receive Jesus, it's talking about Jesus. To them, those who receive him, gave he power or he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you believe on his name? then you have become the son of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? The sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And we did a series on how to be led by the Spirit of God. That's one of the most vitally important things Every Christian needs to know how to be led by the Spirit of God because God can save your life through being led by the Spirit of God. That's how you fulfill the high calling. That's how you receive all that God wants you to have is by being led by the Spirit. And if you missed that series, I also encourage you to go to my YouTube channel again and listen to that series called How to Be Led by the Holy Spirit. It is one of the greatest things that you can learn how to do in your Christian life. But as we talked about in that series, it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Actually, the word sons there is the adult son, not even a baby but an adult. And then let's read Galatians 3.26. Galatians 3.26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God through faith 
in Christ Jesus. You know, we've heard about being children of God. Another way to say it is being sons of God. And some people are really afraid to say that. And yet, I'm showing you, and I'm going to show you more, scripture after scripture after scripture, that tells us that we are the sons of God. Let me read Galatians 3.26 again. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Ephesians 1, 5. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So we are adopted as sons and also born as sons. Now that's important. We are born again into the family of God. God gives us new birth. That's what salvation is. New birth Born again, you've heard that before, we are born again into the family of God, we are the children of God, but notice this, we are not only born into the family of God, we are also adopted into the family of God. Isn't that interesting? Born, why would a born child have to be adopted into the family that they're born into? Well, notice this. Adoption is a covenant. Adoption is a covenant. When people adopt a child, they legally sign a contract that they are taking that child into their family, giving that child their name, and then they can never disown that child. They can never disown that child because this is a contract or more importantly, a covenant relationship. So you see, in the natural, there have been, sad to say, there have been fathers who have disowned their children for one reason or another. Especially we hear about people in other religions that when their children get born again, become a Christian, they disown them. You're no longer in our religion. You are no longer my child. You are no longer my son. And they disown them. Well, you can never be disowned when you're adopted. And so adoption is a covenant that cannot be broken. So we are born into God's family. So we are children of God by birth and by blood, the blood of Jesus. But we are also adopted. So he, he gave us birth and then he made a covenant with us, adopting us into his family. Hallelujah. We are adopted as children of God as well as born. So we have covenant relationship with God as our father. Hallelujah. And then another scripture, Philippians 2.15, Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So the sons of God. And then 1 John 3, 1. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. And then the next verse, verse 2, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So notice it does not say we will become the sons of God. It says now are we the sons of God. 
We're not just going to become the sons of God when we go to heaven. No, you're not going to heaven if you're not already a son of God. No, it's being a son of God that will let you go to heaven. You're not going unless you are now the son of God. You get born again and you become a son of God. And son of God is both for men and women. You know, male and female are both sons of God. Because back in Galatians 3, if you keep reading after verse 26, Galatians 3.26, we read, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The next verse says there's neither slave nor free, Greek nor Gentile or whatever. And then it says neither male nor female. There's no neither male nor female in Christ. We are all one in Christ. We are all the sons of God. So women are the sons of God when they're born again as much as men. We are all, it says in Galatians 3.26 again, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So notice, I've just read to you seven scriptures that talk about we are the sons of God. Now we'll talk about more scriptures later, but we need to dig into that and get a revelation of what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, Jesus gave us a parable that explains what it means. In Luke 15, let's go to Luke 15. And I'm going to read this to you. This is a very familiar parable, most commonly called the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, starting In verse 11 to the end of the chapter, verse 32. Let me read that to you. And then we're going to dig into this parable and look at it line by line. Because there's a lot more revelation hidden in this parable than most Christians have ever seen. You know, we've heard this. You say, oh, I know that story. No, you don't. Listen up carefully because you don't know it like you're going to know it and then even after these things we're studying now we don't know it yet like we will know it in the future so let me read it Luke 15 starting in verse 11 Jesus continued there was a man who had two sons you know this parable should be called not just the parable of the prodigal son but the parable of two sons Verse 12, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, 
He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he says this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. Now, this parable, as we have said, has been most commonly called the parable of the prodigal son. And most of the preaching on this parable has been about the younger son. The younger son. But I want you to notice, this parable is not just about one son. It's about two sons. It's not only about two sons, but it's also about two sons and a father. Now, we know in the in this parable the symbolism is that the father represents God. Amen? The father represents God. And the younger son represents those who have gone away from God. So those are both the people who are not born again and also those who were at one time born again, but they have backslidden. We call them backslidden Christians. And they have gone back into the world. And that brings up again our study on the kingdom of God. And we have said there are two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of God and also the kingdom of this world. So let's look at this parable also like that. That... The father's home and his estate is the kingdom of God. And when it says in verse 13, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. Let's see that as the kingdom of this world. That's the kingdom of this world. And it says there he squandered his wealth. Well, first of all, we can notice, and and we won't take a lot of time in this, but looking at the younger son, notice he went to a distant country, which would be, we would consider the kingdom of this world. He left the father's house. He left the father's estate. He left the father's provision. He left relationship with the father. And notice he went out into the world. And when there was a famine in the land, he also was in need along with everybody else. He experienced the famine along with everybody else. He was in the world. And when the world had famine, he too had famine. He was in need. He was in lack. And notice he hired himself out and he went into the fields to feed pigs and he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. He wanted even, you know, that's the worst stuff. That's the garbage. And in, I mean, nowadays they sometimes feed pigs on grain or something, but throughout history, the pigs have been given the garbage, the leftover food. That is basically rubbish. And he wanted to eat that. And he said, but no one gave him anything. Notice again, there is the slavery in the world that you work and work and work and get nothing. Notice that in the system of the world, you toil and get nothing or little. No one gave him anything. But 
notice also that there are two sons here. And this parable is just as much about the older son as it is about the younger son. And yet, I don't think there are many preachers who really have preached much on the older son. But let's look at it like this. The younger son had a serious problem. The younger son had a serious problem. His problem was that he was away from the father, outside of the kingdom of God, away from the father's estate, in the world slaving and toiling and getting little or nothing. His problem was that he was away from the father. But let us take a look at the older son because the older son represents millions of Christians. He is a picture of millions of Christians. But he also had a serious problem. And we need to ask ourselves, and you need to ask yourself, do you have the same problem that this older son had? Do you have this problem? Let's look at the older son. He is a picture of Christians with a big problem. Let's go to verse 25. Verse 25. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Stop. Stop. Right there. Right there. You can begin to identify his problem. What is his problem? Well, let's take a look again at the whole picture. The father, as we said, represents God. This father, as we see, he has an estate. He has an estate. Because the younger son give me, said in verse 12, giving me my share of the estate. So he had an estate. Well, also on this estate, he had fields, and also we see he has servants, because the father said to the servants to bring the robe. So there is a father, obviously he is a rich man, and he's a picture of God, so we know he's rich. God is rich, this father was rich, this father has land, He has property, he has estate, and he has servants. Now, in that picture, if I ask you this question, in a situation where there's a rich man with estate, lands, fields, and servants, who works in the fields? Who works? works in the fields. The servants work in the fields. The servants work in the fields. The older son was in the field. Why? Why was he in the field? The answer is because he did not see himself as a son, but as a servant or a slave. Let's use the word slave. He had a slave mentality. Slave mentality. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What is your mentality his mentality was not the mentality of a son but the mentality of a slave and I'll prove it to you 
You say, oh, I don't think so, Terry. I'll prove it. Look at verse 29. Verse 29. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Right there, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This older son confessed what was in his heart. What was abundant in his heart was the slave mentality. I've been slaving for you. I don't ever disobey your orders. He did not see himself as a son, but as a slave. Now, what is the difference between a slave and a Son, well, we are out of time. We'll talk about it tomorrow. We will go into the study of the difference between a slave mentality and a son mentality. Which one do you have? Join me again tomorrow. And remember, God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He has given you new birth and adoption. You are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.